were slaves, African American, who had had a rough time during this this big this big war. And there was an area that used to be a racetrack where all of the Union soldiers had been taken and buried in mass graves. And these freedmen got together in Charleston, and they took and exhumed all the bodies and identified them as well as they could. And they had a coming together. This was in 1865. This had not just been a place they buried people, it had also been a prison camp for the Union soldiers. And if any of you have ever read about that, it was a very, very difficult time for the Union soldiers. But on May 1st, they gathered together a crowd of people. Now, when we think of gathering together a crowd of people, we think of maybe a thousand people. 2,800 people, mainly black residents of the Charleston area, got together with children. They had a parade and they sang songs. And all of the graves that they had made, they went through and made sure that every grave had flowers on it. And it was called Decoration Day. And so, when you think of that, here are these, most of these people had just been freed from being slaves, and they're taking their time and their energy to honor the unions. And it's something that you hardly ever read about. We think of Memorial Day as a day that we go out and remember our people who had passed. But how many of you take flowers to put on the graves of everybody? And that's what happened with the songs and the energy. And the oval of the racetrack is still there. It's right next to the Citadel. So every day, the cadets in the Citadel run the racetrack without realizing, because there is no marker there that says this is what happened. And these are the young people who are forming our country in the future. So some people in Charleston decide they want to remember, and they had a mock ceremony. And they brought together hundreds of people to once more celebrate with children singing and flowers. And I want you to think about that today. How many of our celebrations do we have without knowing how they got started? What, who started this celebration that, that we're doing? It's not a celebration as much as an observance, but still it's one of those things that you want to say, thank you for giving up your time and your energy to honor those people who were there to help. So there were many speeches that day, and they found that people of all different backgrounds came together. It wasn't just one group, but they had people who were German and Irish, and because it had been a baptism of blood. A lot of people who were fighting in the Civil War weren't born here in the United States. They were born elsewhere, and they came to do the fighting. But by the end of the 1870s, most of the people who joined were both either blue and gray. They, they had gotten rid of a lot of the rancor, although some still sits in the South. But by the 1950s, the theme in that area was one of honoring all soldiers. They got together and talked about how exceptional America is. So when you think of the millions of soldiers who have served this country in all the various branches of the service, honor those freed men who first gave our country the idea for such an observance as Memorial Day. In 1861, Abraham Lincoln said in the closing words of his first inaugural address, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have been strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone, all over this proud land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. I want to read that again, okay? We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have been strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. 
The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. So today, think of the better angel of your nature. And there are a lot of different places that we get passages for reflection from, from different faiths, from different groups. In the Upanishads, Hindu writings, we read, Lead us from unreality to reality. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to life. Which remind us, gather back together again. So, and for those of you who believe in reincarnation, as they do in the Hindu faith, that's what it's saying. We're going to be gathering together to come back. And now I have somebody I'd like to read the Taoist tradition. Is that, isn't that you, Joyce? Is yours the Taoist? Yes. Would you stand to me, please? <laughs> I'm sitting here going, oh. <laughs> Caught me. Taoist tradition. Lao Tzu, a Chinese mystic philosopher, um, had this to say. I have three previous things which I hold fast and prize. The first is gentleness. The second is frugality. The third is humility, which keeps me from putting myself above others. Be gentle and you can be bold. Be frugal and you can be generous. Avoid putting yourself before others and you can become a leader of all people. Wow. Lao Tzu. Yeah. And uh, Gloria, I believe you have an Islamic prayer. Praise be to the Lord of the universe who has created us and made us into tribes and nations, that we may know each other, not that we may despise each other, and trust God. For God is the one that hears and knows all things, and most gracious are the servants of God, who walk on the earth in humility. When we address them, we should say, Peace. Ah. Very good. In peace. And from the Hebrew, make a book of wisdom. The souls of the just are in the hands of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seem in the view of the foolish to be dead, and their passing away was thought an affection, and their going forth from us utter destruction, but they are in peace. Very, very good. And in the New Testament, John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Since Memorial Day was originally set up for reconciliation, it would be so meaningful to have a time to celebrate fallen soldiers, those who have died in a day of remembrance and reconciliation, a coming together to, re to create a bond between all of us. I'd like you to join me in honoring everyone as members of God's family as we seek peace in the land. And I'd like for everyone here who's had somebody who has been in the service or has themselves served, just stand and call out the names. Let's do it one at a time. Who has somebody in their family that was in the service? Okay, sure. Um, my father was in the Air Force. My brother Paul was in the Air Force. My brother Carson was in the Air Force. Thank you. Laura? My brother Dan was in the Army in Vietnam. Thank you. Gloria? My father, my husband, my sons. Thank you so much. Very cool. My great uncle was lost in battle during World War II, and I don't remember his name. Thank you. Yeah. He was missing in action. Quirky. My pop was uh, in the Army in World War II and in the Korean War, and my brother uncle was in the, uh, he was in the color guard. He was actually in the, I think he was in the Army, Frank Gray. Yes, my brother. <laughs> my brother was in the um, army. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. My father was in the navy. Joyce. Um, interesting history. I had someone in my family on my father's side 
that served for the Confederacy, which I thought was intriguing. Yes. <laughs> um, he was very ranked, apparently. Anyway, then my brother, Joseph, went to Nam. My de brother Dan was in the army, but was released because he fell and almost broke his neck. But those were the family members that I recall. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Kat, you're not standing. No, I'll have them. <laughs> okay, let me see. Oh. Uh, Gramps was in the Navy. Dad was in the Army. Two of my brothers were in the Army. I was in the Air Force, and my son was in the Navy. Wow. Thank you for your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what about you? <laughs> yeah, <Air Force. laughs> um, my, my grandfather was in the Army. His brother was in the Navy. Both World War uh, II. I think their brother was also in the Navy, but he didn't quite make it to that. Um, my ex-husband was in the Navy and his brother. I was in the Army. My uncle was, um, or Army Reserves, my uncle was in the Army. My son-in-law was in the Army. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Mary. Uh, my dad was in the Army. Both of my grandfathers were in the Army. All of my uncles were in the Army. My dad's name was Ray. And they were a real Army family, except Uncle Bob. Who was in the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ronnie. Oh, well, I'm going down there. this way. Sorry about that. <clears throat> My grandfather, Amos Clare, was in the United States Army during World War II. My uncle, Watkins Grigsby, was in the Army during World War II. Um, my, my oldest brother, Gus, uh, a veteran of Vietnam, my second brother Emmanuel, a vet, an army veteran of Vietnam. My second brother Emmanuel, an army veteran of Vietnam. And I am a, am a proud Vietnam veteran. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, my grandfather. My grandfather, my mother's father, was uh, in the army in World War II. My father was in the army in the Korean War. And my cousin was in the Navy. Anybody else in that room? Uh, David? Yeah. Uh, uh, my dad was in the Army, and uh, he was in the Korean War and Vietnam. And uh, I have a cousin, John, who's in the Air Force now, serving now. And he's in, actually he's in Germany right now. Okay. Thank you. Did you have anybody in your family? I, I had I had my uh, my dad my dad was in the navy during World War II and my my older brother was in the in the navy. Thank you. Daddy? My great grandfather was in the army. My two grandfathers were in the army as well. Uh, my father was in the army. My brother was the Navy broke the routine. <laughs> <laughs> Just was a rebel to start with. And uh, that's it. So, oh, my ex husband was in the Navy as well. Right up. Anyway, I was in the Navy. My first father in law was a naval aviator at AC World War II and the POW in Korea. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. My uncle served in World War II. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> my uncle George was in the Army. Anybody else? Okay. April. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot. My husband Lee was in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> it was before I knew him. Um, and my father-in-law was in the Navy during World War II in an island, the Pacific Islands. Okay, Chris. lost his leg. Uh, he had a wooden leg, that's what I remember about him. Uh, he lost that in World War I. Um, my dad, who's 91 and a half, served with Kennedy in the Pacific Theater. I'm really proud of him. Thank you for sharing. 
Yeah. I have a brother who was in the Navy and got a severe, severe, he fell in the ship and he got a severe brain injury. My mom is 80 and still carries for him. But I haven't spoken to my mother in 20 years. She's still caring for my brother. Wow. I forgot to mention, I have two uncles who were kamikaze pilots. Wow. And uh, their names were uh, Hiroshi, and the other was Isao. And one died at Iwo Jima, and the other one was Saipan. Yeah. Um, I would like to stand up for Reverend Corey Gott, mm -hmm. who is a proud United States Marine. Yes, Ask her, she will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she got a lot more Her brother, uh, Brian, was was a is a veteran of the United States Air Force. Yeah, Zeke. Yeah, Zeke. Zeke is a Purple Heart winner from Vietnam. Yes. yes. Um, I have a brother who was stationed in Germany and he re-upped once in that magical pre nom time of peace. <laughs> uh, my first husband was in the Navy. I, I don't know where, when. Um, and I understand, my recollection is telling me that my dad served in something we never hear about anymore, the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's an just stand up. Uh, all of you who are people that were in the service, and you have a sheet in front of you, and let's sing God Bless America. Are you ready? Kat, could you start us? Um, I'm not the pitch heart. What else is that song? God, God bless America. She was small enough to crawl into it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, and, and all of that, and I forgot to name people in my family. I was, I'm very proud of one of my brothers who was in special services during uh, Vietnam. My dad was in the Air Force. Um, my uncle Hans Grossoff uh, was uh, here uh, and had set a, a law was made. He was given the order to bomb his hometown in Germany and he was an American soldier. And he, he called back to the, however they were dispatched and said, Sir, that's where I was born. And the guy said, fly the best you can, which meant he didn't drop any bombs. And uh, <laughs> then they filed a, a, a whole bill in Congress that you would never have to fight in or bomb your hometown based on what Hans mm -hmm. went through. But he was just a fantastic, fantastic person. Mm -hmm. And my sister Eva was in the Air Force. My brother uh, Buddy was in the Air Force. My brother, uh, you know, this is wonderful. I have so many brothers that all of a sudden I go, plunk. Dale. Dale. <laughs> 
And uh, my other brother, who is now in Bahrain, and uh, whose name just uh, all of a sudden Tim. Be Tim, Timothy. Uh, when the, our last name was Falls, F A L L S, so all of the kids in the family are named after geographical places. And so, uh, <laughs> it's even you, of, and even me, there was Dorothy Falls, Falls in uh, New Jersey. Um, but uh, the one that was interesting is my grandfather uh, fought in the Spanish American War, and was. Uh, had all sorts of trophies from that. So thank you so much and, for doing that. And the one with the lemon drop was a drummer in, in the Civil War. Yes. <laughs> my uh, my wonderful, wonderful, great, great, great grandfather. He was eight years old and he was a drummer boy during the Civil War and was at Gettysburg when Lincoln gave his address. And they said, Oh, what did he say? He said, All I was thinking of is that we were going to get pink lemonade when this was all over. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that some guy stood up there and talked and talked and talked. And that was not Lincoln, that was Frederick Douglass. <laughs> for two hours. Yeah. And so you can imagine an eight year old in the hot sun just. <sighs> he, he was there. And that's interesting to meet somebody who knew somebody who was uh, at Gettysburg. You have to be pretty old to have that happen. He lived to be 100. No, we lived to be 99 and, and 11 months, but we, we kind of cheat on one month there and say, yeah. Also, uh, Bryce George, uh, Brian Armani, who uh, was in the Marines, who is my uh, grandson-in-law. So we, we, have, we come from a lot of people like that also. Now, we're, we have two services today. We have two sermons. Isn't this fun? Because I want to talk about something completely different. And I have the wonderful Margaret who is here. And she's going to play a song and sing it about a labyrinth, which I think is what we are in when we're in war, is how do we get through the labyrinth. So Margaret, if you could come up and play for us. We are always so delighted when we, we see Margaret appear. It's like, yes. And you notice that Sean isn't here, and Carolyn isn't here, and, and Janet isn't here, and, and so Margaret is here. Yay! Yay! Is she top lover? Uh, no, she's not top lover. No, she is our, here. Oh, yeah, but she is our savior today because she's going to give us some wonderful music. And then I'm hoping Ronnie will sing something. Yeah, Mr. Chopper over there. No. <laughs> 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 so, and you can sing that. Okay. And, no, I'm gonna sit oh, well, so, okay. I can, so I can really listen. Do you want us to move this on in front? No, this is fine. This is great. Good. Now I was actually, I was actually thinking, this is, well, when you walk a labyrinth. The idea in walking a labyrinth is it's not a maze. There is only one way to go in and come back out. And when you go into the labyrinth, you leave something there that you no longer need. You put it down, and then you walk back out. And so you are, and it's the same path going in and coming back out. But you are, it's who you are while you're in there. And so if you are forgiving your enemies, I mean, you know, that is a labyrinthine path because it takes a long time to forgive and put it down and come back out again. And sometimes you have to do it more than once. <laughs>
I've done memorials in every, in every area that you can think of. I've done a memorial in a cathedral, and I've done a memorial standing beside the ocean. I've done a memorial here in the center, and I've done a memorial, uh, Ronnie and I have done quite a few memorials, in fact. Some over at Lima. And wherever they are, it's the music and the quotes that people talk about whether they're taking quotes from the Bible or whether it's from the Hill Quran, whatever it's from. And the mu music that they played, one of my favorite was done outside the mansion. And this little lady came up to me. She was, you know, I really knew Harold. And I said, well, good. And I'm so excited to be at his memorial. Good, little tiny lady. She sat down. Well, Harold's ex-wife and his kids didn't want anything sad. They didn't want it to be Christian. They didn't want it to be any faith. They wanted to be remembering him. And I said, okay. And they wanted everybody who wanted to talk to be able to talk. And I went out there. We'd put up, what, 50 chairs? Mm -hmm. And we had to put up 50 more. Because Harold had touched so many people. Harold had uh, worked with Tony Robbins. Harold had uh, worked for a big company. Harold had lived in a neighborhood where he was ahead of the neighborhood watch. Um, Harold had done, and he belonged to the railroad train group. So Harold had lots of people and lots of grandchildren, lots of kids. And so we're there. And I had to call the airport and ask them, so can I have a balloon release? I don't know if you know that, but when you're in the pathway, you call the airport. And they said, yes, we can do it between 2 and 2.15. No airplanes were taking off or landing at that time. Okay, so here we have all of the teenagers are holding balloons. I thought that would keep them occupied for a while, you know. <laughs> and, and, it, and all of a sudden, this woman gets up and starts channeling. I had no idea. He was, his second wife was a channel. And everybody else was kind of scoffing about her channeling. You know, now she thinks she's talking to Harold, you know. And uh, it didn't bother her at all. She just went home and said what Harold was saying. And they decided that the song that they were going to close with was Spanish Eyes, which is not your typical memorial song, you know. <laughs> so we do the, the balloon release, and we're to when Spanish Eyes are shining. And it's when Spanish Eyes are shining, think of me, which is perfect, you know. And everybody's applauding, and some are dancing, and it's all, oh, and so finally, ah, they had loads of food and a lot of booze. So it was a great send-off for Harold. And this little lady comes up to me, and she just could barely walk. She just tottered up to me, and she said, Pastor Boone? I said, yeah, she says, this is just like one of the services at my church. And I said, it is. She said, yes. And I said, what are you? And she said, Southern Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I thought, you know, you get what you're looking for. <laughs> this has obviously not been, when God was never mentioned. I mean, it was like, well, thank you, my dear. And I'll always remember Harold's funeral, or memorial, really. I've only done one funeral, and it happened that Ronnie and I did a funeral. And the body was there, and after I did the service, I was ready to go. And somebody said, and what are you going to say graveside? And I went, I had never done a funeral before. I had to say something at the graveside over in this mausoleum across the street from Lima. I had to walk all the way over Walk all the way over there, and all these people are converging, and they're all looking at me, bright-eyed. And I said, Ronnie. He goes, yeah. I said, sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> and, I, and so I said, now. And he got up in the mausoleum, and his voice was like, mm -hmm. And he, he, he sang, and I looked around, and everybody was crying. I thought, we did well, right? <laughs> and, I said, and I want to thank you all very much for sharing this time with us. And they, so he saved me from looking like a complete idiot. Once more, thank you. <laughs> so, as I'm saying this, what uh, or do you think of the people might be saying? What music would you like played? Do you know you can write that all down? And they'll do it, or not, you don't care, really. <laughs> and for me, my mom, when, when I was cleaning up the different things in her house before her memorial, every drawer had, all I ask of you is forever to remember me as loving you, on a piece of paper. We found them in her, her uh, you know, lingerie drawer. We found them tucked away with her social security papers. We found them in her insurance papers. Every, every drawer. There was all I ask of you is forever to remember me as loving you. And she and my brother and my sister and a lot of us had, and I don't know who else from here was there, but we were up at Mount Shasta, and we were saying <coughs> where you put your hand on the other person's heart, and you look into their eyes deeply, and you sing. All I ask of you is forever to remember me as loving you. And so <coughs> that was the song, and it was the last time that she had been with my brother and my friend Byron, and everybody was there in Mount Shasta singing that. And so we, we did that at her <coughs> memorial. And my mother loved to dance. She danced in the, in the 30s and uh, 40s and 50s. And whenever, when she was 10, she <coughs> used to do the Charleston on the street to raise money during the Depression. So at the beginning, I said, OK, and we put on String of Pearls by Glenn Miller, and I told the whole congregation, let's dance. And to picture my mom in front of you and let's dance, and so we all danced. Wow. And during that, this, somebody said, look. And there were three dolphins. <laughs> and uh, we all went, wow. Because my mom had three children left after having lost one. And it was just like, yeah, she was saying, hey, I'm here. And that happens during memorials. You can feel people. You can sense people. And so, you know, when you think of that, I, Gloria has met my mother in spirit over at Sea Cliff Beach because there is a, a table and benches and on one end it says Eleanor Wow Ostroga and the other it says blessed is the spot. My mom was a Baha'i and that's the beginning of a Baha'i prayer, blessed is the spot. And so if you're ever going to Sea Cliff and you can wander around until you find the picnic bench, Gloria, you had a hard time getting people off the benches, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> She's, that's wild. That's wild table of benches. And just think of that. That, that keeps going. So uh, I've now asked people to plant trees in the backyard in memory of people. You can even, they will take your ashes and put it into a biodegradable bag with a sapling so you can plant it in your ashes, uh, uh, naturally fertilize the tree. And uh, a lot of people are getting those now, so you can put a tree wherever you want. Uh, when, instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to put them in the ground, you put a tree in the ground. <laughs> that works. That feels really good. So there's so many things that you can do in memorial. So think about, you know, later, maybe later today for Memorial Day, write down, what do you want? Who do you want to have invited? You, when you leave here, people don't know who your friends are. 
You know, if I was going to do a memorial for one of you, I wouldn't know who your close friends are. So just write yeah, down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because just think, then your then your sons, daughters, whoever get a chance to have to find them. You know, it's kind of fun. It's a treasure hunt. These are the people I'd like to know that I, I made my passing. Yes, April. Um, I read a book called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, and she's a, um, a mortuary person, and she wrote that the most challenging thing she had to experience day in and day out was when the grieving family was being asked to make decisions that they couldn't make because they didn't know, and how hard that was. And so the most loving thing she said you could do is to write these things down. And then when your family is feeling the grief and loss, they can just hand over your request instead of trying to guess and all the trauma that's created around that. Right, right. And so you think about that. What is it? Yes, Patty. There are books right now that are really, really good that have every single thing in it. And I have a son who is not going to manage this well at all. So I have done everything for him. I mean, it's this book is... You follow A, B, C, D. I feel very controlling, but I also know that his brother's death, he just, he was not good for almost two years. So I don't want this to happen when I go. And so this is the easiest way. And I have people, you know, that are going to take care of this and this and this. If they would quit dying, I... What happens when you get to a certain age? Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, one of them died at 51. And I mean, that's, no, that's not ex you know, no excuse for that. Yeah, yeah. I was very upset with that. Very annoying. It really <laughs> threw my whole whole uh, program off. So, uh, but do look into those books because they're a lot easier than you know making a binder and you can forget things really easily. So. Yes, Chris. The making those decisions in advance um, also helps to work backward. So. When you ask what song, for example, there's a lot of beautiful music, but um, I pretty much settled on one particular song. Edith Piaf, Je ne regrette rien, I regret nothing. And the reason that that's important to me is I want to have a convergence of the song and my life right. being in alignment. Right. And so it allows me to go, okay, Here's my target, right? Here's my target. How close am I? And as I make choices in my life, it's one of the beacons for me of which choice am I going to make. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And I get to change my mind at the end, but it's still the beacon for now. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you have prayers or if you have anything, just whether it's a binder, whether it's a CD, and then tell them, uh, you know, as many people as you can, this is what I want. Because it does give them a guide, you know, they can do it or they cannot do it. But think about what it is. I do not care for cut flowers. So please, I don't want bunches of flowers dying wherever I am. If I die, I'm not going to worry about it, I'm sure, on the other side. But, but dying flowers always bother me. I always have, I have to pray for every pebble, you know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So think about what it is that you really like and let people know. You know, just say this when I go. What my mother always said is because she, until she was 76, she cleaned a, a wonderful swimming pool in the middle of the mobile home park where she lived. And she got so tired of cleaning that pool and having to dump the filter. She said, when I die, take my ashes and throw them in the pool. <laughs> and that'll show that jerk that I'm working for. <laughs> but by the time... She, at 90 hit, she was no longer that upset with the fellow in the home park. And so we didn't have to do that. Instead, uh, my mother is in the, in the trunk of my car. She loved to travel. So wherever we go, we take mom with us. And we talk to her every time we open up the trunk. We go, hi mom, how are you doing? What's going on? Now, do I think my mother is in the trunk of my car? No. Her cremains are in the trunk of my car. I speak more of my mom when the lids down than I do when the lids up. Yes, <laughs> Ronnie. As Dottie has told you, I participate in a lot of the memorials that she uh, she takes part of. One of the most memorable memorials that I remember was the burying of Cass Bullard. Oh. Mm -hmm. For those of you that don't know who Cass Bullard was, 
he was Mr. Piano. Mm -hmm. Yes. He played piano in Nordstrom. Uh, in women's lingerie. In women's lingerie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you knew Cass, you knew that that was the place where Cass should <laughs> <laughs> But at his memorial, it was over, I think they called it First Church. And the minister got up and prayed and opened up the service. And the minister sat down. And for 90 minutes, Cass Bullard played piano. Mm. And nobody said a word, but he played piano. One of the most memorable memorials I will ever see. You mm. know, because people say, well, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want when I'm dead. He not only said this is what he wanted, but he did what he wanted. Yeah, that's great. All right. Anybody who ever heard him play could tell that was Cass on the phone. <coughs> on the phone, keep it. Oh, yeah. That well, if you want to hear him play, you get Ronnie's uh, CD in the last four cuts or a uh, wonderful Cass Bullard uh, playing for him, and that just, which was really great. And the thing about memorials, uh, so many people feel that they should be sad, and I've had more fun laughter at memorials about some of the things that they did. Um, mm -hmm. I want to share one. My father had passed. I had a very interesting weekend. Twelve, I don't know how many years ago it was that Sherry got married to Gary. But I needed to be up in uh, Vancouver. Vancouver to do the wedding. And I was delighted. We got and just as we get off the plane, I get a call that my, my father has died. And they want to do a very, they're going to do a memorial. So I did a wedding, got back on the plane, flew to Arizona to do my dad's memorial. And as I got off the plane, I got a call that my husband just had a heart attack. So it was kind of one of those weekends that you go, what <laughs> next, you know? So we got there, and the, we, got, we stood around the swimming pool to sing songs. My dad was a, was a Baha'i. And we were going to sing some of the Baha'i songs. And so as we're standing around there, my, one of my brothers looked in the pool needed to be cleaned. And he said, this reminds me of at home with Dad. We're all outside here looking at a green pool and Dad's asleep upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> thought, That's true. That's true. There, and uh, it was because uh, when you're, when they're, you're the eldest of ten kids, it's uh, quite a few kids and family and everybody else. And, uh, so we had this wonderful memorial, all giggling, laughing, and telling dad stories. And with a little bit of booze mixed in, it became pretty hilarious. So, <laughs> however, you know, whether it's an Irish wake or whatever you're doing, make sure you say positive things about them, too. The, I think the most, most unusual was right here. A woman um, called and said, I, I want to do a service for my mother. And I, she had alienated everybody. So it was her and her husband and me. And Corky, you weren't even here, I don't think. And, and, and they put the obituary in the paper that the memorial was going to be here. And we're here. And she's saying, my mother, you know, during the war, she worked uh, putting together airplanes or whatever. This elderly man wanders in. And he said, yeah, I knew Betsy. Knew her quite well, I might say. <laughs> so did every guy that went to that bar. <laughs> During the war, she did the most she could to cheer up the troops. What do you say? I looked at the, looked at the daughter, and she looked at me, and the, the, her husband just couldn't stop laughing. And then uh, he had an urn, and he went over and patted it, and you know, at the bottom. We'll repeat that one too. <laughs> uh, so, yay, Betsy. So you never know what's That's going great. to be happening. No, you don't. You know, and uh, and who's going to show up? You know, I've had one where you know her three ex-husbands showed up. So, Whoa. that was interesting. So think about that. What do you want to have said? And some people said, I wanted someone to say the world was a better place because I lived. Yeah, just think, every day we're, we're causing people to think of us and remember us. So we want to be nice to them. 
Because of, think of what they might say when we die. <laughs> How about, they knew what was important in life. Isn't that a great one? Somebody stand up and say, you know, they really knew what was important in life. And they go on and say something that you did that was memorable. Or how about, they always had a good word to say about folks. Wouldn't you like them to say that about you? <laughs> or, no matter what, she was always there when needed. Now think about that and the people you know, that you could stand up and say that. They were always there when needed. How about they lived to the fullest and didn't waste the gift of life? You know? Or they might not always have talked about God, but when I was around them, I felt their spirit. So there are so many. And know that you can always tell when you meet a spiritual being. And they could be Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist, but you can get that feel of their spirituality. And the reason I talk about this because this is our opportunity to make a good memorial. Isn't that fun? You know, think of what you want people to remember you for. And as you're going through life saying, hey, when, hey, Jan, when I die, I'd like for you to talk at my memorial, okay? And give them some ideas of what we did. And our, uh, you know, and, and like our, uh, my wonderful friend Joyce Brown, who drove all the way over from Santa Cruz today, <laughs> she's, she's got some dotty stories, and oh, I yeah. love it, and she shared them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, and she's she dead, didn't she? <laughs> and and, and, and you can now. even pat my hurt on the bottom if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will. But, yeah. <laughs> the wonderful things that, and how you've impressed people and what they're going to say. And go home and write down some of the things that you would like to have done in your memorial. Dottie, can yes. I say something? Yes. Can I say something, please? <clears throat> you know, oh, having participated in lots of family memorials and friends and over the years, you always feel, I used to always feel something was missing. Until we started doing the memorials five years ago for, our, for my siblings, the youngest and those older than me. And um, the most amazing one was my sister Letty Ann. And I tell you this for a reason. Letty Ann was just hellfire, that's all there was about it. Letty Ann will tell you what she, what she thought whether you wanted to know or not. <laughs> but she was very kind very generous, very giving, would do what she could to help you, but sometimes she would just go off and lose it, and then she was sorry. And she felt really bad if you didn't say it was okay. And that was how we ended, actually. My sister called me on a Monday. She was dead on Wednesday. And we had settled a, f a feud we had. Yeah. At her memorial, I told the story about her telling me that if I didn't get in there and fight and whoop very and and whoop this woman named Easter Jean, she was gonna whoop me. I was a child, I was about 10, 11. I whooped Easter Jean. <laughs> I did now. Because a country girl, I threw some rights, threw some lefts, I kicked her, I, I did everything. <laughs> my sister brought out my strength and my courage that I could do this and not let somebody push me around. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I have done that. If I back away from something, it's only because I just back away. But it's not because somebody pushes me around. I learned something from that, and I spoke about that at her memorial. And the whole church was full of people, almost, from Mississippi, where we all come from. Black and white, whatever, mixed. You, you, we were in there. And I just wanted to say that Settling things before someone goes, and you know they're very ill, and they call you up, and you see it, and you feel it, and they know it, and they're saying goodbye to you. My sister needed to make peace with me. I made peace with my sister. So what I'm saying to you is you make peace. Somebody is, is there. They're at that door. They're at that gate. They're at that portal. Maybe even that kind of labyrinth where they're going in, but they may not come out the way they went in. Mm -hmm. Make peace. Do not sit there and talk about, oh gosh, I wish I had. 
Right. Don't don't do that. It's not it's not all right. It's not all right because then you carry it and you feel bad for such a long time. Yeah. When you can make the peace, right. you can make the peace. Thank you. Thank I just you. wanted to share that. That is so true. And and also, let Ann told me to get up and do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, hey, I saw it. She just kicked you up. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite favorite poems that I, I do just about every memorial. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to dates on her casket from beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of her birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was a dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth, and now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you would like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what is true and real, and always try to understand the way other people feel, and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more, and love the people in our lives like we have never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? And uh, I like this one joke that I came about. It says, the biggest downside of sudden unexpected death is being unable to de delete your internet search history. <laughs> and the other one is, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> that was Woody Allen. Um, and so I want to leave you with these things of, I have time to let people know who I am, what I need, what I want to do, how I want to spend my life. But most of all, to tell them that you love them. There's still time. And are you ready, our wonderful, wonderful Margaret, to play your last song? Bless you. I hear a sneezing baby. Yes. <laughs> this is a song I wrote for my father um, after he died. I tried writing songs about him when he was alive and it never worked. And then after he died, I wanted to have a song to sing at his memorial. And so I said, now would be a good time. <laughs> and, and it came through. So I was really glad to be able to do that as a tribute for him. Do you want this in the mic? Do you want this in the mic? Sure. Yeah, thank you. You were the one who taught me to drive. You said turn left, we'll just go around the corner. I wasn't sure we'd leave that parking lot alive. <laughs> Sound financial advice you gave me over time. You told me, kid, don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> and don't spend it all at once when you'd give me a dime. There's no mountain of dimes that could equal the time spent with I owe who I am to you, Dad. You were the one who gave me away, then took me back 
when I said, this isn't working. <laughs> you called every week to make sure I was okay. You didn't say much, but you always would ask me what's new. I healed and I grew thanks to you. Oh, <laughs> 